All right, we're going to start our webinar now. Uh, I'm Kelly Hill, your moderator, technology reporter for RCR Wireless News. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panelists today. We have Andy Germano, who is Vice President of Small Cell Forum. Rob Wattenberg, Head of North, America product, uh, North American Product Management for Rudy and Schwartz. Greg Spear, Senior Solution Manager for Exceedian Networks. And Deepak Sivakumar, who is Manager for Sales Engineering at a Knight. And uh, you will be hearing from each of them. Uh, I'm going to start us off with a little bit of insight on uh, some small cell news, uh, particularly finishing off with Mobile World Congress. We had quite a bit of small cell related news there. Uh, we had Irvana's One Cell and Huawei's LAMP site small cell solutions being recognized with awards in terms of infrastructure and innovation. Uh, in January, we had SK Telecom and Nokia announcing the first commercial launch of EICIC, um, which is uh, interference uh, feature management for uh, for small cells. We had the Small Cell Forum, again, again at Mobile World Congress, uh, with its release five for rural and remote applications. I believe we'll be hearing some more from Andy uh, on that most, uh, most recent release. Coming up, we have the Etsy and the Small Cell Forum's uh, latest plug fast in April, which tests small cell interoperability. Um, this is going to be their first remote event uh, this is the latest in a series of small cell testing uh, events that they that uh, Etsy and the Small Cell Forum have done, um, and there's quite a bit more information on some of the results of those plug fests uh, in the report that is going to be available by tomorrow on rcrwireless.com. Um, we had Ericsson demonstrating license-assisted access for LTE unlicensed in small cells. Uh, we also are starting to see more antenna support in small cells for up to quad band uh, capabilities which, uh, you know, is expanding the spectrum band support. So, uh, you know, it's definitely a step forward in, in what those uh, antennas are capable of. So talking some more about the report, um, the small cell market is still maturing in terms of cost, technical, and deployment issues, uh, particularly when it comes to urban public access small cells. You know, the residential use case, I think, is, is quite a bit more established. Um, you know, often that has been... Uh, relying on whitelists of users, and so there's not necessarily the same issues in terms of interference and handovers. Uh, standards for the technology are also continually evolving. We're particularly seeing things like SON, that's still a moving target in terms of the development of the standard. Um, industry bodies are providing a number of resources, uh, research and testing, as well as best practice recommendations. Um, we'll see in the next slide that, uh, that I've listed some of those if you are looking for more information on this. Um, new processes, uh, you know, maybe loosening some traditional testing approaches or relying on more network-based information and analytics will likely be needed in order to uh, fit into the cost and deployment time pressures that uh, that vendors are facing in terms of, um, you know, what operators expect and expect in terms of both time to market and the cost for small cells. And uh, the evolution to small cells, though a bit slower than expected, uh, is still seen as pretty much inevitable, uh, not just for deepening LTE coverage and capacity and densifying the networks, um, but there's also some vendors who believe that small cells are going to play a significant role in the concept of 5G. So I do get into that a little bit in the report. We're starting to see a lot of chatter around that and the, the role that small cells will potentially play there. Um, so talking about some of those resources, you know, if there was one thing I found in the reporting of this is that <clears throat> there really is quite a bit out there. Um, and, and a lot of it, you know, has some very good technical information as well as business case information. Um, if you're interested in reading up on, uh, you know, on some of the interoperability testing that's been going on, uh, from the Etsy and Small Cell Forum. Um, those results are, are, are published uh, and the web address is there. Um, they are anonymized, so you won't necessarily be able to tell which vendor uh, you know, had uh, which results, but um, you know, it's still, I think, a good window into, into the interoperability development that's going on. Um, Small Cell Forum, uh, all of its releases and some, some really good information there from them. Uh, testing suggestions, small cell case studies, uh, you know, all of those are available. So, so check that out. Um, the Next Generation Mobile Network Alliance technical documents, um, particularly on multi-vendor SON, uh, recommended best practices is, is definitely, I would consider a good read. 
um, 3GPP if you wanted to kind of get the big picture on where they're going and the work that is ongoing, the work that's already been done, and, and what's ahead. Um, those are available. And then uh, IWPC also has uh, a series of technical documents on small cells. So, you know, those are some additional resources if you're looking for, uh, for more information. And then, as I mentioned, the, the report that I've been working on that, that kind of collates and synthesizes a lot of that, as well as, um, you know, fleshing that out with a lot of interviews from across the ecosystem, that's going to be available on www.rcrwireless.com by tomorrow morning. So um, I want to move into our presenters uh, section, and we're going to start off with Andy Germano from the Small Cell Forum. Andy? Great. Uh, thank you, Kelly. So just uh, I'm Andy Germano, Vice President of the Small Cell Forum. This first slide is just showing the, the recent focus of the forum, really uh, defining residential, enterprise, urban, and rural type of uh, small cell environments. So if you look at the next slide, we're showing uh, who we are. The Small Cell Forum is a member-driven organization. We've got about 150 member companies consisting of about 66 operators that represent 3 billion global mobile subscribers. And then we have about 76 uh, vendor members that represent all aspects of the small cell ecosystem, everything from chip suppliers to components, software, access points, infrastructure, system integrators, uh, and testing uh, type of, of uh, companies. We've been around since uh, 2007. It's a nonprofit. Uh, we welcome you know, all of you uh, member companies to join, whether you're an operator or a vendor. And really, we're focused on ecosystem development around the small cell ecosystem, uh, market education, and then driving open standards. We're not a standards organization ourselves, but we have liaison relationships with all of the relevant uh, standards bodies, such as 3GPP and NGMN, uh, Open Mobile Alliance, to drive open standards that relate to small cells. So the next slide just talks a little bit about the release program. So at Mobile World Congress last week, we had our fifth release in the release series. We've now published over 100 documents that are hosted, as Kelly mentioned, on our website. You can easily download them at www.scf, small cell forum, uh, scf.io. And this just talks about how the release program works. So we start out with our operators. Uh, we've got our uh, you know, 66 operator members that represent 3 billion mobile subscribers, and they really create the requirements documents, you know, the requirements uh, for the small cells. What are the areas that operators feel are important for the industry to work on? And then that feeds into our release steering committee. And then uh, moving through this uh, slide here, the, uh, the release steering committee feeds into our different working groups. We've got uh, various working groups, uh, marketing, radio, physical layer, uh, core network, uh, regulatory services, interoperability, backhaul, uh, rural deployment, and so we've got different working groups on the next slide um, that focus on you know the specific requirements that come from the operators, and then the working groups produce these hundred documents, and they're published here at this SCF.io. Um, since we started the release program two years ago with release one that focused on residential, we've had over a hundred thousand downloads now. So release one was residential. Go to the next slide. Release two was enterprise focused. Uh, release three and four uh, was urban. It was uh, broken to two releases. And then what we just announced last week was release five, which is the uh, rural and remote type application. And so over 100 documents, over 100,000 downloads, and each specific release is kind of a cookbook. You know, everything you need to know about residential, everything you need to know about enterprise, and that's really what we've done. So in the future, the next release is planned for this summer. We'll focus on uh, virtualization, uh, virtualized network, small cells, both in the core as well as in the, uh, the radio access network. And then for each release, we also go back to previous release documents and do any you know, editing, cleanup, evolution that's required in the existing documents as well. So the next slide, Kelly. So next we want to talk specifically about uh, what we announced last week at Mobile World Congress. That so was this release five, rule and remote. So this release has uh, 16 documents, including uh, business drivers, case studies. We've got uh, documents on backhaul and deployment, as well as the overall architecture with rural and remote. So rural is, uh, there was a study that was done by uh, Real uh, Wireless as part of Release 5, and they uh, found that by supporting rural and remote with the uh, small cells, they could deliver mobile broadband to an additional 650 million folks. So there's about a, about a billion people globally that are currently uh, uncovered you know, for mobile service and just the economics aren't there. 
with traditional macro technology, but with small cells, uh, the ability to deliver mobile broadband to 650 million additional users represents a GDP benefit of almost $1 trillion. So pretty significant opportunity. And it's not just you know rural applications, it's also what we call remote applications. So using small cells on airplanes, cruise ships, trains, uh, oil and gas, uh, you know, uh, remote oil rigs and, and, and all these types of applications. We also have operators that are using them for disaster recovery, you know, using satellite backhaul. So quite a number of use cases in release five that are defined by these documents. Uh, next slide. So this is the market update. We talked in the beginning about the uptake in small cells, so a little bit, uh, you know, slower like with any new technology, but uh, still really solid numbers. We've got a number of operators that have deployed over a million uh, small cells in their networks, and we're seeing, you know, announcements every day of new operators using small cells to address the different use cases, residential, urban, enterprise, and rural. So this just shows, you know, where we are today, and you can see there's a significant growth forecast uh, in the enterprise segment. And then even though the urban segment looks relatively small, it still represents quite a large uh, revenue opportunity for the industry. There was a study done last year that showed, you know, while the urban segment was was relatively small, it still represented about 60% of the revenue since, you know, the cost of a residential uh, access point may be sub $100, whereas an urban deployment, you know, may be significantly higher than that. Uh, next slide. And then uh, finally, you know, getting to the uh, the call today, we're talking about the uh, plug fest. So Small Cell Forum has had a number of plug fests. We're just announcing our first remote plug fest. This is the uh, the fifth uh, plug fest that we've had. So the first one was focused on the IUH interface, which is the connection from the small cell to the core network. And we also did uh, a second plug fest that looked at the, uh, the TR69 or network management uh, capability for uh, small cells, and then the last two we did were LTE uh, focused. So the main area of focus for this upcoming PlugFest is carrier aggregation, again, a, a topic that we'll be discussing further on the call today. And then we've got a couple of other uh, more regulatory uh, areas that we're gonna have included in the PlugFest or highlighted in the PlugFest, which is uh, local IP access, and then also uh, selected uh, IP traffic offload and uh, closed subscriber groups. So there'll be a number of uh, test cases included in the current plug fest just to give you an idea of some of the uh, the previous uh, plug fests we had um, in this one coming we've got uh, 45 uh, new test cases and that's a an average number for each plug fest we run about one plug fest per one plug fest per year and uh, there's quite a lot of uh, interaction on the last one we had about 26 our participating companies and that uh, we've been holding these plug fests in cooperation with uh, with Etsy and, and NGMN and, and our industry uh, partners. So, really, the uh, the small cell forum plug fests play a key role in cultivating an effective ecosystem of interoperability for small cells, and it helps to debug the vendor implementations, drive the resolution of standards ambiguities and gaps. So, the first plug fest we had on the IUH interface, we found a lot of you know companies passing what we realized was that there was a need for further definition of, of IUH since you know one vendor's IUH was not it was standards compliant and other vendors IUH was standards compliant but there were still you know some ambiguities that we were able to identify in these plug fests and also helps provide the operators uh, and, and consumers with uh, you know more choice for their small cell products and it facilitates economies of scale to bring the small cell mass market uh, closer. So that's uh, pretty much the summary of uh, my presentation. I guess we'll have questions at the end. Thank yes, you, Kelly. we will. Thank you, Andy. And uh, you know, I really encourage folks to to take a look at um, you know at some of those PlugFest results. I think it very it it really does give uh, a, a window both into kind of the evolution of the of the equipment and the development and the software, um, and it also. I think is a you know is a nice indicator of you know of the things that are of the most interest to the industry um, and uh, you know this this upcoming event is remote but um, you know and I think that, uh, that having the next release be uh, from the small cell forum be focused on virtualization I think it is also very indicative of some of the current trends in the industry. Um, yes, so Kelly, um, that's a good point. So if you go to the scf.io, download document number 85. 
Mm -hmm. That has all the history, all the details of the PlugFest that we've completed. So you can get a lot of data, and there's some references to the Etsy documents as well on overall you know, how to run a PlugFest and you know all the to-do on a PlugFest. So document 85 on scf.io would be a great resource for you if you're interested in this uh, PlugFest. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Andy Germano, Vice President of the Small Cell Forum. Um, I do want to remind our, our participants that we are taking questions. We're leaving time for Q&A at the end. So if you have questions that come up as you're watching your presentation, you know, as we go through all of these, please submit it and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. And so right now I'm going to move on to Greg Spear of Exedia Networks. Greg? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, so just to give you a, an idea here with Exceeding Networks, so we're celebrating our 10th anniversary this year and really our, our specialty is performance monitoring. So uh, let's, we can move on to the ne next slide. So we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, in our experience we've, we've been around and working with small cells and so, uh, you know, mobile backhaul and really the, the traditional, you know, testing of, of having to test set at each location and so forth you know, the expertise required, the time, and so forth. Uh, we saw uh, an opportunity there. Uh, we can go to the, to the next slide. So using, you know, test probes is, 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 has been very good as well. Basically, from a, from a central location, right, we can send the information to all the different remotes and find out if that's all, all working okay. Um, once again, though, we, we, we're not testing everything. We're doing round-trip testing. And as we get into these more advanced uh, applications, you know, of, of, of people being able to determine the one-way delay and testing from site to site will become uh, more important. So, so the amount of testing you can do and, and, and the scaling of this with, with the manpower requirements can be, can be quite limiting. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So what we've been uh, developing over the past few years is uh, really taking the, uh, the, uh, the intelligence and the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, all the testing capabilities and so forth and miniaturizing them, getting to the point where we can get everything that we need into a, into a smart SFP, a very small SFP. And some of the more intelligent uh, functions that are required are offloaded and done on a server somewhere else in the network. So we virtualize the functions that a traditional testing demarcation device would do and really use the the uh, the uh, just a, a small SFP as a port at the remote location uh, with some FPGA and some timing in there, so we can actually do the testing. So now, uh, you know, without having to have somebody plug in the test set or whatever, we can actually do remote testing from one remote to another remote location, or from a central location to multiple remotes, and we can also generate the traffic. Uh, either from a central location to the remote or from the remote location itself. So really we have all the, uh, all the combinations that are there. Now this also gives us uh, the ability to do one-way delay measurement so we can see the, the delay in one way compared to just having a, a round-trip uh, type of report. And we can support uh, standards, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with like Y1564, RFC 2544, which really help you know, the, the, the operators and providers have a good baseline of how the network is working uh, before they actually turn up a service. And we can actually then, after that, do continuous monitoring using other standards like TWAMP or Y1731 to uh, monitor the, the network uh, ongoing. Uh, I can go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, yeah. So really, uh, at, at this point, what that gives us is a way to, you know, you don't need to have uh, as, as many hands out in the field it's basically a device that gets plugged in, that gets discovered by a, 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 uh, a central uh, management system. And I, I don't want to scare anybody with central management system. It's a very, very lean uh, type of, uh, of discovery process. And then from there, we, we can start testing to the cell site, to the to small cell. And we could even test from small cell to small cell. So uh, if you know there's going to be a lot of traffic between different small cells or whatever, you can actually run traffic between those two as well. Uh, so the next one. So there's different uh, bits and pieces here that, that we've seen. So we do have um, an EMS that can be used, and we can also do uh, service provisioning per flows. Uh, we can monitor bandwidth per flow. Um, as I said, we can do 
traffic generating from, from the central locations to the remote and in both directions. And then showing here the options of, you know, being able to do these tests in, in, in all different directions. And um, so, so this is a way for, you know, when you're deploying uh, to be able to really crank up the amount of, of uh, small cells you could turn up in a day. Obviously, we're, we're testing right to the small cell device itself. We're not, you know, the back hall part of it. The front hall is not being tested. But this would, you know, give uh, people a, a, a good, um, a good uh, reference point as to if anything comes up later on, is it the back hall or, or the front hall, you have a good demarcation of, uh, of the testing of one compared to the other. Okay. So in a nutshell, that's it. Great. Great. Well, yeah, and and it's interesting that you discuss that because um, you know one of the things I definitely ran into was this issue of scale and uh, you know and being able to uh, more efficiently test small cells, you know, so that they can deploy as many as possible. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll we'll get into some discussion on that uh, a little bit later. But um, for right now, we're going to move on to Deepet uh, to Deepak from Anite. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Deepak Shivakumar. I manage sales engineering at Anite Network Testing. So, uh, next slide, Kelly. Okay. Uh, so, a small introduction into our company. So, we are a specialist in wireless testing and network analytics. Um, so, what we do is we provide both test and measurement solutions to operators. Uh, engineering organizations, customers who are into optimizing wireless networks. Uh, we are based out of the UK, uh, listed on the London Stock Exchange with about 500 people globally. And specific to our Anite network testing, uh, since we are in the business of improving network quality, uh, we again provide tools to optimize wireless networks. Our main office is based out of Finland, with offices in Dallas, Forest and Chantilly, Virginia, Paris and Singapore. Um, now, our customers, uh, we have a wide area of customers in the mobile ecosystem, so mainly operators, equipment manufacturers, uh, chipset vendors, regulatory bodies, and engineering organizations. Uh, next slide, Kelly. Okay. So we are purely a products business, a products business, so we don't do any testing ourselves, but pr we provide mainly both software and hardware solutions to companies, so they can test for themselves and optimize their networks. Um, and although we are predominantly a software-based business, uh, we do provide hardware as required uh, with some of our solutions. And our, and our main objective, uh, as you can see, some of the use cases listed below are, you know, our main objective is to simplify field testing using automation uh, so that the field test teams can mainly be productive and provide results uh, efficiently as well. Um, so some of the use cases we've listed below, uh, and especially, you know, uh, specific to indoor testing. Uh, now, we are, again, again, we are in the macro mar market uh, dominantly, but uh, specific to indoor for today's webinar. Um, you know, there's the optimization phase, uh, the troubleshooting and benchmarking, uh, the site survey phase of, uh, you know, uh, an indoor deployment. Uh, the previous slide? Yeah. And then we also have our site acceptance. Uh, where that's where you know you walk into a venue and you have all your analytics that is required uh, before uh, you know to actually say if the venue is a pass or a fail, and then comes the small cell analytics um, and finally the reporting and the analysis picture uh, the part also comes in. Next slide, please. So specific to our indoor portfolio or our small cell and DAS portfolio. Uh, we have a complete tool set for indoor measurement, verification, and acceptance. And what I've listed here is two different, um, you know, two different elements. One is the field testing part and the other is the network analytics. And so from a data collection standpoint, uh, you know, one of the most widely used uh, platforms out there is Nemo Walker Air and Nemo Handy. Uh, which is actually used to measure the RF, measure the air interface between the base station or the actual access point and antenna and the device itself. So once all of this information is captured, uh, at that point, this is sent to a post-processing platform. Uh, and you can see that there, there are two elements, the ones in between reporting and analysis. 
Uh, so all the data that's collected is sent to either Nemo Windcatcher or Nemo Synergy, where all this data is processed um, and all this data is crunched, and the walk tester or the optimization engineer gets some real, you know, deep drill analytics, which they can then use uh, either during their site survey, I mean, either during their design package, or during their optimization uh, phase. And <clears throat> the last block that you see there for automation is, um, I, yeah. So the last block you see there for automation is the, you know, it, that's always been the missing link between field testing and network analytics, which really ties uh, all of this together where, uh, you know, in order to make the field teams more efficient and simplify their process, uh, an automation comes in where, you know, the walk tester collects all this data and before they even leave the venue, uh, they get all, all the analytics as part of the, uh, you know, the post-processing function. So, Overall, what you're looking at is, you know, a complete indoor product portfolio, which is meant to fix issues in the indoor network as and when you have field teams collecting data uh, and analyzing and optimizing these. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, great. And now we're going to move on to Rob from Rudy and Schwartz. Hi, this is Rob Weinberg. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. I'm the North American product manager of the mobile network test segment at Rudy Schwartz. Um, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this first slide, but um, suffice it to say that Roden Schwartz historically has been a very large player in that lower block of areas with uh, you know, mostly UE conformance testing and BTS interoperability and SIGGENs and things like that. Interference hunting is a big area. Uh, but a few years ago, what Roden Schwartz did was they acquired a company named SwissQual and a company named IPOC who are um, who really complete the the, the product portfolio for the mobile ecosystem. And that gets us out in the field and it gets us in the IP domain as well. So can I go ahead and jump, jump to the next slide? And, and what, I, what I thought I would focus on here in, in the short time that I have is the things that we're seeing in this segment. And, and it's, it's very timely that we're talking about small cells and DAS and, and all the technologies that are rolling today because it is driving a tremendous amount of activity for us. Uh, so what we're seeing is, I would say, more than 80% of the activity we get on a day-to-day -day basis is driven from people who are trying to deploy in-building networks, optimize them, install them, and figure out a way to do it at a reasonable cost. And it's a real challenge. Uh, so that's that's one point that I think is, is worth noting, and it drives what we do with our product line. The next thing that really is hitting us hard, and and as the uh, as Deepak will, I'm sure, be able to, to agree, uh, the UE turnover out there in the marketplace really drives us. Um, for instance, if Volti is a technology that's being deployed, a new UE is what comes with it. Carry aggregation, new UE. New new uh, bands are being deployed all over the place. Things are being refarmed. UEs roll with that. And that drives what goes into our product. So that's, that's another area that we're very focused on. And, and what that means, too, is that... Um, the shelf life of your tools becomes very short, and that's a, an economic area that we have to address for the company. Um, and then the other thing is, as I keep hearing, this is a common thread throughout, there is huge pressure on resources. And I think this has been common in the, in the network testing world over the years as we went from having, you know, highly qualified engineers driving from place to place to trying to figure out how to get those guys back in the office where they can be more productive. Uh, th th that pressure is probably no greater than it is today because just the, the sheer scale of deploying smaller networks in more and more places, you just can't afford to throw engineers all over the place. So that, again, drives what we do within our product line. Um, and then the one thing that comes along with that, that pressure is the diversity of requirements that, that we get. So we might get, we might see requirements for an in-building system that's going into a hospital that's mission critical backup to a, an embedded, um, you know, Wi-Fi network, say. Um, that has a whole set of requirements and very different than the guy who's trying to cover, um, you know, a small maybe shopping center where all he cares about is does it work? Do I have block calls or drop calls or can I get, you know, respectable throughput? So those, those things drive, you know, who is testing? how they're testing it and the tools underneath that. So we, um, we have to, of course, accommodate that with our tools. 
And one thing that we cannot lose sight of is we can test all this technology under the hood, but in the end, the end user has to be serviced with what they do with their devices. So we can't forget about audio quality and video quality and, and what are people doing with their data services and, and is it behaving the way that, that makes them happy? Uh, it could be that uh, you know, too much throughput is just overkill. Uh, we always have a saying in, in, our, in our shop that um, uh, better is sometimes the enemy of good enough. And so we have to stay focused on what really the end users um, are doing with their, with their, with their devices. Uh, go ahead and jump to my last slide, Kelly. So looking at the product portfolio, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. If anybody wants any further information, you can go to the, the Roden Schwartz websites um, and look under mobile network tests. But we've got all kinds of tools from base station installation maintenance to interference hunting, which is a really hot area right now, particularly in building where you've got a lot of people who've done crazy things with BDA that, that can create all kinds of interference on LT networks. And it, you know, LTE is most harmed by interferers, so hunting for those things is critical. So we've got a really specialized set of tools for that. Uh, if you look into the macro world, we've got a great set of tools for benchmarking in the macro environment. Um, and then moving into this RAN verification, acceptance, and optimization column that you see, that's where we've invested more energy in products. So we've made them, we've had to make them from small and affordable to uh, complex um, and, and more thorough in terms of what they can test. Uh, again, the overarching need is to make them simpler to use so that you don't have to have your smartest guys out in the field. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is a great deal of pressure to reduce the amount of post data collection analysis. A lot of people want to get to, am I good or am I bad? And there's a lot of work that goes into that in terms of automation of data processing. And the, the shorter that cycle gets, the better. The other area we're seeing a lot of activity, uh, it's not mature yet, but we're seeing a lot of activity here is in the IP traffic analysis. So we're embedding a lot of technology inside the IP domain to see what we can do to help customers optimize that space. And that really comes into play with technologies such as Volte where, um, you know, that not just is my pipe big enough, but, you know, how well is it performing become uh, a driving force. So that was that was what I had to present in just a nutshell. So hopefully I didn't take too much time up for you, Kelly. Okay. Great, great. Well, folks, we're going to start uh, taking some questions now. Um, I want to kind of start out with a, a general kind of thirty-five thousand foot view, um, and and I have a feeling Andy might uh, might be the person to start with on this. But I wanted to just kind of ask in general what momentum you see for small cells. Um, you know, whether there are particular use cases, you know, urban, rural, enterprise, residential that you see as being well established or, you know, some maybe that are starting to gain ground and uh, and what you see as the major hurdles. So, Andy, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you on that and then um, I'm going to open that up to our other participants. Uh, you know, Rob, you mentioned some trends that you folks are seeing, but uh, Andy, maybe we can start with you. Okay, sure. Yeah, that sounds great, Kelly. If you look at the four use cases with residential, it's all about, you know, self-organizing capability and more about automating the deployment process, you know, getting the costs down, allowing the consumers to do self-install, plug and play. But if you look back at the uh, the market forecast that I showed that comes from uh, Joe Madden's uh, mobile experts group, they are showing a really large uh, growth area for enterprise applications. So one of the uh, previous presenters uh, also mentioned, you know, some of the tools that they have for uh, enterprise deployments and some of the, the issues you might see around enterprise. So enterprise is, uh, you know, relatively small uh, deployments to date, but we're seeing a huge uh, growth and a lot of activity in enterprise for these, these in-building uh, deployments. So certainly that's an area where I think we'll see the most, uh, you know, sheer number of deployments and, and the largest growth. And then uh, some of the other tools we saw in the previous presentations were looking more at the outdoor networks and looking at uh, you know, the coordination between the macros. We, we talked about the you know, EICIC and uh, one of the test cases from our previous uh, plug fest was really all around the, uh, the integration of the, the uh, small cell network with the, uh, with the macro network. And so there's a lot of opportunity there to ensure that uh, you know, some of the network and frequency planning that you have to do macro to macro once you have your small cells in an urban context for capacity usage, then you're going to need to have that, that tight coordination between the small cell and the macro network 
in the residential case where you're really looking more at a coverage play or in the enterprise case where it's more of a coverage play, the interaction between the macro from each individual small cell is not as critical, but what we see the focus in the enterprise is to have a, uh, a coordination just from an entry and exit point of a given enterprise into the mm -hmm. macro network. So those are some of the trends uh, that we're seeing. Um, anybody else want to jump on this one? In terms of momentum and use cases that you're seeing particularly people try and test for? Sure. So, uh, hi, this is Deepak. So, you know, we have definitely seen the last five to six months a lot of use cases coming up, uh, especially in the enterprise uh, enterprise space where, you know, it, it, and it's not just coverage and capacity that, that they're trying to fill at this point. Uh, there is also that focus on how to monetize, you know, once you have all of these small cells deployed. Um, so definitely even, uh, you know, besides the residential space, where there are already a lot of initiatives on the, especially in the rural rural areas, on trying to get small cells up and running. Uh, we definitely see a lot happening on the enterprise side as well. Okay, great. Um, I, I want to answer, we've had this asked a couple of times, uh, whether the presentation will be available. Yes, it will be available. Um, I believe everyone who's registered for the webinar will get a copy emailed to them afterwards, um, and it'll also be available on the RCR Wireless website. Um, so uh, another question that we've had uh, come in is, uh, this is a question for all the panelists, uh, but especially for Andy, um, isn't it time that small cells had an official certification program? Um, any opinions there? You know, it's a really great question. In fact, I just got the action item uh, this, this week to uh, take a further look. So we have reviewed that at, at our board uh, level over the, over the last few years. And, you know, some of the initial feedback or thinking was that it wasn't time yet or, you know, we weren't ready yet. But we've done these plug fests now. We've, we've had a number of plug fests with great participation and excellent results. And if you read that, uh, that document that I referenced earlier, from the uh, scf.io, I think it, what I said was document uh, 85. There's uh, actually a, a recommendation there. There's a there's a picture in there, uh, right in the beginning that shows you know how the whole interoperability uh, process works, and it ends up with uh, you know conformance testing at, at the uh, the recommendation there, and that's really you know where we're going with this. So today we've been doing uh, plug fests at the early stage of small cells just to have that vendor interoperability so different vendors access points can work and interoperate with different vendors core network equipment and you know allowing the the different test equipment um, and network management equipment to interoperate with different vendors uh, access points and core and so the next step really is to uh, to look at uh, some some form of certification so I'm actually uh, just just getting into that now to uh, make some recommendations on how we would go about and evolve the uh, the interoperability program towards more of a uh, certification program. Okay. Um, great. Uh, any other opinions on whether you'd like to, whether we have folks here who would also like to see a certification program? Yeah, Greg, Greg McFeedy and we, we, we've worked with other, you know, with the MEF or Ethernet, with the cable app and so forth, and certification always makes it easier for everybody to be on the same, uh, you know, level playing field and, and interoperating and, and everybody speaking the same language. It seems simple, but it, it's always been very helpful for us, I find. Okay. Um, I want to jump to another question that we had come in uh, that I think is relevant to, in particular, to our uh, to our vendor folks. Um, the question, uh, and there's two, there's two parts to this question. Um, one is what metrics do you measure for small cell networks, and the other is what kinds of actions do you take based on those measured metrics? Um, you know, I think having uh, folks here with expertise in the testing range, um, that's right up your alley. So is there anybody who'd like to, to, uh, to take that first? Um, yeah, this hi, is Rob. I'll, I'll take a, oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Deepak. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. Why don't we have so Rob we, first? And then, Rob, why don't you start us off, and then Deepak will come to you. Okay, real quick, I'll I'll say that the the traditional metrics that we have when we get uh, requirements for measuring in building performance and whatnot, it's usually voice quality, uh, data throughput, and there's a lot of ways you can measure data throughput. So we have to we have to have a lot of flexibility in terms of. Are we doing HTTP type transactions or FTP or even UDP type transactions? Um, those are those are some of the most common metrics. And then obviously the normal voice stuff, which is you know, just blocks drops. And then we have um, also a lot of RF related 
parameters because there is a real need to understand the macro uh, performance and how it influences the, the in-building activity and the small cell stuff. So we have, um, we've had a lot of people come in with a lot of scanner related requirements on top of the, the normal performance requirements. Deepak? Sure. So, you know, just to add uh, to what Rob just mentioned uh, as far as what we've seen in the market. So, you know, you ha you, we have all our traditional metrics that we look at, like, you know, accessibility, retainability, uh, where you see, you know, what is your access success, retainability, you see what is your drop call rate. Um, but also, you know, with small cells, with so much interference coming in, um, it's, it's very important that, you know, at this point, you also start looking deeper into SINAR. Um, so the, all of this falls under RF metrics, so you start looking at your SINAR, and then you had your coverage metrics like RSRP. Um, but besides that, you had your handover metrics, so, so, and that would be anything between the small cells, so a, mac, uh, uh, you know, a small cell to a small cell handover, and also a small cell to an actual macro handover. So you know, as and when folks come in and out of buildings, you know, uh, it's very important that they have seamless handover as well. So that's why, you know, even right now, a lot of the testing that the operators do, they have so many different scenarios as far as ingress testing, egress testing. Um, and, and besides that, you always have your macro ingress uh, metric, which is one of the key metrics where operators would really like to see what is the penetration coming into your building from your macro. Because at that point of time, you know, you, you really don't want your, you know, your user who is inside your building to be connected to the macro outside, but rather have them connected to the small cell that's already deployed. Um, and again, you know, there are different phases, different metrics, you know, during a site survey, there are specific metrics they look at, and, you know, when they do an optimization walk at that point, the metrics start changing and they're more detailed metrics. Okay. Um, and, and from, from a Canadian point, basically, yeah. you, know, you have, um, what happens over the air, but then before it gets to that point, uh, you know, what, what we find people often is if they've found a problem, now we need to identify the source. Is it on the air? Is it in the back? And what we really do is, is provide the delay, delay variation, packet loss, throughput availability right up to the device, not, not the handheld device, but the, the, uh, the, uh, the radio. Um, and also uh, from there, we, we, have, we could do testing to validate, you know, the uh, the, the, the service is good up until that point. And we can also derive uh, MOS scores from there, so we have an idea of the data quality and the voice quality right up to the, uh, to the small cell radio. Okay, great. Um, we had a question about ramping. Um, uh, AT&T pushing out their small cell build plan into next year. Do you guys see small cell deployments in the U.S. really taking off in 2016? Um, I, I think I want, I'd like to, to answer that briefly based on some of the interviews that I had. I had a, quite a few people uh, uh, who think that the, the broader availability of LTE small cells is going to influence uh, the rate at which operators are going to deploy that. Um, you know, we've had 3G small cells out there for a while, particularly in the residential use case, but as more small cells uh, with 4G capabilities, you know, potentially some also with Wi-Fi capabilities, which we're starting to see now as well. Um, as we see more of those, you know, the, the what I ran into was, was the, the common opinion that, um, that operators didn't necessarily want to put a whole lot of resources into 3G when they were making LTE rollouts. They, they would rather put those resources into 4G and that we'll see more of a ramp up in, uh, in maybe 2017 particularly uh, as uh, as things go forward. Um, I also talked to Stefan Pongratz, who is uh, with Deloro Group, and uh, he said that there was actually a fairly decent ramp in the second half of 2014 going into 2015. Um, you know, that, uh, that, that the investment in small cells was about 1% of the overall RAND market in 2014, about 2% in 2015, and then they expect that to be a big, bigger percentage going forward. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to, uh, to talk about the, the, de the timeline deployment that they see uh, in terms of when we'll start to, uh, to really um, get into some broader deployments. Sure, yeah, this is uh, Andy Germano from Small Cell Forum. Mm -hmm. So I think we're seeing, uh, you know, quite, quite a good uh, ramp. You asked about, you know, U.S. deployments uh, the week before Mobile World. 
Congress, we had an announcement from Verizon, you know, using small cells to address capacity in in a given city. Um, I think it was San Francisco. And then during uh, Mobile World Congress, we saw a presentation from AT&T talking about how they used uh, small cells in New York City and the benefits there and kind of a how-to, how they, how they did it to address uh, capacity issues in uh, in New York City. So I think um, where maybe the question comes around is if we see these uh, giant forecasts for you know big numbers of small cells. If you look at the urban context, we did a study with 3G that showed with only four small cells per macro cell, you can offload 50% of the data traffic. So for capacity applications, you know, four small cells offloading, you know, 50% of a macro, and that results in like a 350% user experience improvement for everybody in the cell, macro and small cell. The small cell users get like a 500 uh, plus 500 uh, percent user experience improvement. So you don't really need a lot of small cells to have these enormous benefits of capacity, but what you need to do is the small cells need to be in the right location. They need to be in the hot spot where you can offload and get the maximum benefit. So I think maybe that's where we're saying, oh, well, you know, small cells rollout is a little bit slower than we thought, but it's actually um, with you know, with a, with a, a few number of, of small cells, you can actually have enormous uh, benefits. So I'm actually seeing, I even heard, had an announcement uh, last week from T-Mobile here in the U.S., and we had uh, presentations from uh, China Mobile in, in China. We've heard that uh, in Shanghai, there's uh, all the, the lampposts in the city, like uh, one million uh, points of presence are being uh, retrofitted to be able to handle, you know, small cells. So I think there's actually a lot of uh, activity going on uh, from my perspective in the small cell region. Where we're seeing the big growth opportunity, uh, we didn't see as many uptake in the residential and you know the original residential small cells were more 3G focused so I agree with your point on on you know looking towards LTE but in this enterprise market it seems that uh, that there's also a big opportunity the uh, the numbers are there if you if you if you look at uh, the reports uh, like YouGov uh, published 60 percent of enterprise uh, users in the US 60 percent are reporting poor in building coverage uh, and in the UK it was something like in the 35 percent range so the the need is there to provide this coverage and I think what we're seeing from the mobile operator perspective is that they can only do so much you know so quickly so there may be an opportunity as well for you know additional uh, resources uh, system integrators and building owners to try to accelerate some of the uh, the deployment to address the uh, you know the coverage in building coverage issues okay. Great. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, in practice, what has been the most common solution in terms of small cell backhauling? Um, so I, I'm curious as to what each of you is seeing uh, in terms of back backhaul technologies being used. Um, Greg, maybe you might have some perspective there. Um, from, from what the ones I've seen is, is there's been uh, dark fiber is one that we've seen. Um, and, and uh, but I haven't had that that much exposure to uh, to um, installations uh, as you said you know it's good that our part of the uh, of the puzzle is, is still people are still thinking about how they're going to be testing to to the device uh, okay. but I don't know if other people have more insight on that but the ones I've seen have just been dark fiber going to the to the device okay. Kelly and, you know just I to add to uh, or go ahead yeah oh go ahead Deepak. Yes, sorry, sorry, jumping in. Uh, but you know, just to add to uh, what Greg was saying, so yeah, you, you know, right now is where a lot of the testing is happening, the site surveys where, you know, operators are really trying to understand what kind of a backhaul system would really, you know, efficiently support a small cell system, and that could be anything, you know, like she mentioned, you know, dark fiber. It could be a point-to-point, -point, multi-point access uh, feeding some of these locations, um, and you know. With a lot of this field testing that's happening right now, uh, when they put together this design package is where they can really come up with a plan as far as, you know, in the future, how much of throughput would be required in a venue like this. And, uh, you know, that, that would really help them plan ahead on what kind of a backhaul system they can bring in. Okay. Rob, was that you who was uh, also interested in this one? Actually, no, not Andy, me, actually. I, I was going to, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I was just going to say, I mean, backhaul is the key, uh, the key question, the key issue, you know, the key area in terms of, you know, deployment. So if you look at uh, you know, every small cell needs a backhaul, and then we talked about putting the, you know, the four small cells per macro in the hot spot. So, the, you know, obviously fiber is, is a preferred backhaul, but you have to really look at the cost 
of fiber in terms of the monthly lease, and then you also have to look at it in terms of the availability. I mean, if the fiber is, is a, across the street, but it's not where you have access to put the small cell, then it could be relatively expensive to move the fiber where you need it. So if you go to that scf.io site, we've actually published a couple of papers on backhaul, and we look at all the types of backhaul available, everything from you know the residential deployments where they're using DSL and cable modems, all the way up through uh, you know fiber, uh, Ethernet, uh, point to point, point to multipoint, licensed, unlicensed, six gigahertz, sixty gigahertz. So there's really a, a lots of different solutions that are available, and it's um, really making use of what you have at a given site. There may be some operators that have easy access to fiber, and they're going to use that as much as they can. But there may be a situation where they decide they want to do a short point-to-point uh, -point, or in a city maybe a, a you know a, a multi-point type of uh, or a, um, a non-line of sight due to you know buildings uh, in the way so they have you know line of sight non-line of sight so these are all the considerations that we review in the paper and we look at all the aspects of backhaul jitter latency uh, we even look at satellite uh, backhaul as an option for small cells so I think um, the comment came up about dark fiber that's really one of the things that we've seen for cloud RAN when you have remote radio heads or virtualized uh, radio you try to separate the base station electronics or the baseband from the RF then you need some really high capacity for the SIPRI interface but um, for other types of small cells you may not need you know that much maybe a uh, you know a point-to-point -point, uh, microwave link is going to be enough to get that uh, you know 100 megabits downlink or 150 megabits with carrier aggregation uh, we've seen some some backhaul links that are able to support you know, high capacity, uh, high capability. So there sure, certainly is a lot of different backhaul options when you're looking at uh, small cells, and that's an area that we've tried to be uh, proactive and define for the industry. Okay, great. Um, I want to ask uh, another question that we had that I think uh, is, is fair game for anyone, and that is how do you see small cells tying in with DAS in the enterprise or tying in with Wi-Fi? Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, I think some, sometimes some different definitions of what exactly is a small cell. Uh, you know, and this whole idea of the heterogeneous network with both, uh, you know, with macro sites, with Wi-Fi, with small cells, you know, is definitely something that, uh, you know, that is seen as kind of a, a, a movement of the industry. So um, I'm curious as to how each of you see small cells tying in with DAS and Wi-Fi. Um, does anybody want to jump on that one? Yeah, this is I'll, 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 I'll take a crack at this, but okay. uh, I, would say, I would say this from our field testing experience, we're getting a tremendous amount of demand to do all those things you just said. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, what's going to happen when a guy's in a macro network doing a video and he walks into a building where his device then flips over to a Wi Fi connection? Yeah. Uh, so for us, we're getting a lot of demand to to give people the performance metrics behind, you know, the user perspective. So it might be, you know, maybe the guy's watching a YouTube video. What happens when he makes that transition? Or if he's on a Volte call and he's now got a hand down into a circuit switch fallback. Um, these are all the things that we're, we're really focusing on measuring in terms of what the end user perspe perspective is in those environments. So although we're, we're, we're seeing demand for the testing, I, I can't really tell you how much of that's going on in the real okay. world. Okay, but the testing demand is there. People are are ask are trying to figure out how those things are working. Um, oh, Deepak, yeah. did I hear you? Did I hear you chime in on that as well? Um, yeah. So you know, from a, a deployment from a deployment standpoint, you know, DAS or small cells or Wi-Fi, you know, is it, really based on the kind of venue, the type of venue, what, how much, uh, you know, what are the challenges around the venue, uh, how much capacity is required, or is it even addressing a capacity issue? So based on that is where a lot of the, uh, you know, based on that is what you would see a lot of these uh, small cell deployments being driven. And right now, if you notice, a lot of the DAS systems are already in place uh, at all these, uh, you know, campus, large buildings, uh, shopping malls. And at this point, you will find that, you know, it, it, it's piecemeal where, you know, if, if there's a requirement really for a small cell, uh, that's where you would see it being deployed. And especially because from a costing standpoint, you know, uh, a DAS is a large investment, uh, definitely, whereas small cell, you know, compared to a DAS is much more affordable for operators to go in and deploy. And now you bring in another piece where there is Wi-Fi, uh, you know, you have your own challenges at that point, 
to see how a Wi-Fi would fit in to a small cell network, a small cell or a DAS network, so that you know interference still has to be addressed through all different ways, and uh, and that's why uh, you know going forward you will see a blend of tools in the market. Uh, do you know? Uh, I mean, you would find SON systems, uh, field testing gears, uh, network analytics solutions, especially to find out uh, and really address a lot of the uh, issues uh, coming up in a DAS small cell head network. Okay. You know, we're we're running up. Uh, we're running uh, out of time. <laughs> we've had a very lively discussion, and we've had a lot of questions from our audience. Um, I would like to encourage anybody who didn't get their specific question answered um, to please follow up either with me, you know, or with the individual uh, presenters if you have some specific questions for them. Um, right now, I would like to uh, to have one final question before we close out, and uh, I'd like to ask what role. Uh, our presenters see in terms of network analytics versus field testing. Um, you know, how do you see those two working, uh, both in terms of network design and testing, uh, as the network becomes more dense and more heterogeneous? Uh, I, I'm curious as to uh, to what your perspectives are on analytics versus uh, versus field testing. Sure. And uh, Deepak, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, what you just mentioned, these are two different elements that really go hand in hand in network analytics and field testing. And the real purpose is to really analyze how your small cells are performing out in a live network in real RF conditions. Um, and, you know, one way to see this is it, it's a way of preventive testing, which would later on minimize your CAPEX and your OPEX. Um, so, which is why a lot of these operators at this point you know, treat this as an investment because, you know, it, it is a smart investment, right? I mean, uh, you optimize your venues, which means you have a better quality network, which means uh, you have a good quality of experience. Uh, so, you know, good quality of experience means you have happier customers, you get their loyalty, and that reduces churn. So, in a way, it is indirect revenue for the company, and, you know, as long as operators see this kind of return, they would keep investing the money, the time, the resources. Mm -hmm. And network analytics is really tied here because, uh, you know, it's, it's not just the RF conditions they're interested in, but, you know, they want to take it one step further and really understand from a performance management or, a, you know, uh, from a configuration management where the issues are. So if you, if you had a drop call for some reason, operators are interested in understanding if is it happening on the device itself or is it a backhaul issue or is it something on the, on the air interface uh, the access point. So it's all it's all tied into each other one way or another. And I think um, you know I, one of the subjects you had today, quality of experience. Yes. Uh, you know, really talks about uh, you know how field testing and network analytics can really address all of the you know customers' issues. Okay, uh, Rob, would you like to uh, to give your opinion on that? Yeah, this, this is always a hotly debated topic in the. In the, in the guys that, that develop tools that need to be used out in the field to understand what the network's doing. Uh, our, the end of our uh, life has been predicted a thousand times because it says, I will be able to do all this without needing all this field test work. <laughs> and I think what we're, what we're seeing is that there's truth to the need to reduce in-field labor is really, really, really big. Analytics is a great step in that direction but there's no substitute for being in the field and understanding what the real user is doing. And so we're seeing more, or less I would say, in-field, real careful optimization where you got a lot of scientists out in the field looking at RF and things like that. And we're seeing more of that being done in the back office with analytics, but we're seeing much more in-field validation, which can be done very economically uh, okay. with, with tools out in the market. Okay. Great. Um, Greg, do you uh, have any perspective on that as well? Yeah, I would like to say uh, everybody's comments are, are, are absolutely right. And, and really, the, as we as was mentioned earlier, you know, the backhaul to the, to the small cell is still very important. So when we're looking at troubleshooting and analytics, uh, you know, being able to test your backhaul and do your continuous performance monitoring of your backhaul will really be key and help you isolating when somebody says, when the call drops. Is it somebody's doing it on the phone? Is it something that happened on the network? If a web page isn't working properly, is it, is it that web page? Is it my backhaul? So, you know, being able to segment the network properly and have have that information so you can rapidly troubleshoot, I think, is is very key to to you know the small cell being a success in the future. Okay, 
Great. Well, gentlemen, thank you all. It was a pleasure to have you. And uh, audience, I hope that this was useful for you. We will have the, uh, the special report on small cell testing posted on rcrwireless.com by tomorrow morning. And I encourage you to follow up on some of the resources that are available, um, both in the slide presentation um, as well as our participants. So thank you so much. This concludes our webinar.